Okay, so we're going to pick up with our annotations here at Acts 5, scene 3. In this particular scene, um, we are taken to a churchyard in Verona and we are taken to the Capulet's tomb where Juliet lies. Now, we have skipped a scene here. You're not missing a video. I've just skipped over the previous scene because it's a very short scene, Act 5, scene 2. And it's the one in which um, Friar Lawrence simply realises that his message was not delivered to Romeo. He meets with another friar, Friar John, who says to him um, that he couldn't deliver the message to Romeo in Mantua that Juliet was only faking her death um, because Mantua was quarantined because of plague in the city and so people were prevented from coming in and out. And the friar realises that he must act very quickly um, to ensure that Juliet is, is not killed in the tomb, that she doesn't die there unrescued. Uh, by Romeo or the worst doesn't happen. So in this scene we're actually at the tomb where um, Romeo uh, travels to to see Juliet's body. Remember he said I defy you stars. He almost doesn't believe this can be the end. He must see her first. Um, but when he arrives uh, Paris is already there mourning Juliet and this is the scene in which Romeo takes his own life with the poison. Juliet wakes and in turn takes her own life. So we're just going to read up until that point and then we're going to read the final part in a separate video. So we are in Verona, we're in a churchyard at the tomb of the Capulets. Give me thy torch, boy, hence and stand aloof. So he's got our servant with him. Yet put it out, for I would not be seen. Under yon yew trees lay thee all along, holding thy ear close to the hollow ground, so shall no foot upon the churchyard tread, being loose and firm with digging up of graves. But thou shalt hear it. Whistle then to me, a signal that thou hearest something approach. Give me these flowers. Give me those flowers. Do as I bid thee. Go. So he's basically saying to his page there, you stand a little way off, you stand guard, um, and you whistle to tell me that somebody has arrived. I want privacy in here. I want to be left alone. Um, I don't want to be disturbed. Tell me if somebody is coming. Um, and so he takes the flowers to go and um, show his... Um, his... Um, Kind of love and respect for Juliet in death. The page agrees, he says, I am almost afraid to stand alone here in the churchyard. Yes, I will adventure. And Paris starts to throw flowers all around the tomb as a marker of respect for Juliet. Paris says, Sweet flower, with flowers thy bridal bed I strew. Oh, woe, thy canopy is dust and stones, which with sweet water nightly I will dew. Or oh, wanting that, with tills, Tears distilled by moans, the obsequies that I for thee will keep, nightly shall be to strew thy grave and weep. This word here just means funeral observances, funeral rites, things that are said um, at a funeral. Notice how Paris calls her a sweet flower, the same way that, that Capriola called her the sweetest flower previously. Again, um, Paris is using the same word. So once again, we've got that imagery to do with innocence, to do with youth, used to describe Juliet, to do with beauty, even upon death. The boy whistles then to tell, Capulet, to tell um, Paris that somebody has arrived. The boy gives warning. Something doth approach. What cursed foot wanders this way tonight to cross my obsequies and true love's right? What, with a torch? Muffle me night a while. So he means, it might hide me while I look out and see who it is. Enter Romeo and Balthazar with a torch, a mattock and a crow of iron. It's like a kind of pickaxe. He's going to use these items to, to open the tomb. Romeo says, give me that mattock and the wrenching iron. Hold, take this letter early in the morning. See thou deliver it to my lord and father. Give me the light. Upon thy life I charge thee, whate'er thou hearst or seest, stand all aloof, and do not interrupt me in this course. So he says, whatever you hear now, Balthazar, don't interrupt me, just let me continue. Don't tell anybody that I'm here, and please don't disturb me or stop me, but please just deliver this letter to my father, to the friar, to all the important people tomorrow. Why I descend into this bed of death is partly to behold my lady's face but chiefly to take thence from her dead finger a precious ring a ring i must use in dear employment therefore hence be gone so he's saying he's, he's going down into the tomb he has to see juliet's face but to also have her wedding ring he needs to have her wedding ring <coughs> and he's kind of inventing an excuse um for balthazar he doesn't really need a ring he just 
He needs to see Juliet one final time. And he says, But if thou jealous dost return to pry, in what my father shall intend to do, by heaven I will tear thee joint by joint and strew this hungry church lord with thy limbs. This time, the time and my intents are savage wild. So his words there to his friend are quite shocking. He's saying, if you interrupt me, I will tear you limb from limb. He kind of threatens his friend with violence and says, leave me alone in this, in this tomb. Do not disturb me. And the bed of death, if you remember earlier on, they keep saying the word wedding bed this bed of death, there is this irony of this progression from the wedding bed to the bed of death, the celebration of death. And there's this sense that Romeo and Juliet can only be reunited fully in death. Remember, in the prologue, their, their relationship is described as death marks love, love that was always doomed to die. So we get this sense that they can only be united upon death. And he says, remember, he threatens Balthazar, this time, the time of my intents are savage wild, more fierce and more inexorable far than empty tigers or the roaring sea. I will be gone, sir, and not trouble ye. So shalt thou show me friendship. Take thou that. And he gives him a purse, gives him some money. Live and be prosperous and farewell, good fellow. So he knows at this moment that he's going to kill himself. So he gives... This to Balthazar, this is his final goodbye to his friend, essentially. Balthazar says, For all this same, I'll hide me here about. His looks I fear, and his intents I doubt. So Balthazar says, Even though he's told me to go away, I'm going to hang around and see, because, you know, I, I'm concerned about his actions here. Romeo says, Thou detestable moor, thy womb of death, gorge with the dearest morsel of the earth, Thus I enforce thy rotten jaws to open, and in despite I'll cram thee with more food. So he's almost calling out here to the tomb itself, but look at the language that he calls, that he uses. So he uses this imagery of fertility, womb, but he uses the womb of death. There's an oxymoron there because we've got life and death, womb for life and death side by side. There's this oxymoron of life alongside death, which reminds us of the impossibility of Romeo and Juliet's relationship, that they almost that they, they can never be together. Equally, the womb of death, that imagery of fertility, shows us the kind of loss of the relationship, the, the fact that there's this kind of relationship that's never satisfied, and that Juliet's full potential and their potential as two lovers together is never quite reached. Um... And remember, there's lots of that imagery to do with fertility earlier on, womb, bud, those kind of things. We have frequently to remind us of that idea about duty and Juliet's role in, in providing children earlier on. But it's now the womb of death. It's as though that um, role is unsatisfied for Juliet and equally for Romeo. Uh, the dearest morsel of the earth, again, the superlative, dearest, sweetest. There's that idea of worship of Juliet once more. Everybody seems to use this kind of worshipping language for her. So he's saying, I'm going to enforce thy rotten jaws open. I'm going to open the, the mouth of the tomb. I'm going to get inside and I'm going to give these rotten jaws of death more life to feast on because he's going to kill himself as well within that tomb. And Romeo begins to open the tomb. This is that banished haughty Montague that murdered my love's cousin, with which grief is supposed the fair creature died, and here is come to do some villainous shame to the dead bodies. I will apprehend him. So Paris thinks that this is Romeo who's killed Tybalt. He believes that Juliet may have died of a broken heart after the after the death of Tybalt, and so he sets out to stop Romeo in whatever he thinks he might be about to do. He still sees him as a villain and an enemy. And Paris steps forth to stop him. Stop thy unhallowed toil, vile Montague. Can vengeance be pursued further than death? Condemned villain, I do apprehend thee. Obey and go with me, for thou must die. So you must fight with me. You must die. I must indeed, and therefore came I hither. Good Gentle youth, tempt not a desperate man. Remember all that motif of madness he keeps talking about. He's fierce, he's wild, he's desperate. It's as though love has made him mad. Fly hence and leave me. Think upon these gone. Let them affright thee, I beseech thee, youth. Put not another sin upon my head by urging me to fury. Oh, be gone. 
By heaven, I love thee better than myself, for I come hither armed against myself. So I love you more than I love me, because I've actually come here to kill myself, says Romeo. Stay not, be gone, live, and hereafter say, a madman's mercy bid thee run away. So again, we've got that motif of madness, the desperation that love brings, but he's also saying to Paris, run away, say that you took my mercy and you ran away and left me to die alone so he does give paris the opportunity not to fight with him i do defy thy conjuration and apprehend thee for a felon here wilt thou provoke me then have at it boy so romeo says to him well you know if, you, if you're intent on a fight i will fight you the page so the the boy who's come with um paris as a servant says oh lord they fight i will go call the watch so he goes to call the equivalent of the police of Verona to prevent the fighting and Paris falls oh I am slain I am killed if thou be merciful open the tomb and lay me with Juliet and in that moment he dies now this part here is Romeo's final soliloquy remember these are the words soliloquy remember is something that's spoken aloud for the benefit of the audience Paris has just died in the tomb Romeo is about to take his own life and these are the final words he says in faith I will let me peruse this face, Mercutio's kinsman, noble county Paris. What said my man when my betossed soul did not attend him as we rode? I think he told me Paris should have married Juliet. Said he not so, or did I dream it so? Or am I mad hearing him talk of Juliet to think it was so? Oh, give me thy hand, one writ with me in sour misfortune's book. Look at the references to fate here. My betossed soul, my soul that is at the mercy of fate. Um, his fate was written in misfortune's book. His fate was already sealed. Um, I'll bury thee in a triumphant grave. So here he's still talking to Paris. He says, I'll bury you in a triumphant grave. A grave? Oh no, a lantern slaughtered youth. For here lies Juliet and her beauty makes this vault a feasting presence full of light. So he talks about how this is not a normal tomb. This is a lantern. This is a place full of light. Remember, Juliet is often associated with that light imagery. So even though this is a place of death, Romeo is associating it with hope and life. And he lays Paris out in the tomb. How often when men are at the point of death have they been merry, which their keepers call a lightning before death? Oh, how may I call this a lightning? Oh, my love, my wife, Death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty. Again, imagery to do with beauty and youth, the honey of your breath. Remember, she's referred to as the sweetest flower earlier on. Thou art not conquered. Beauty's in sign yet is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks, and death's pale flag is not advanced here. Tybalt, liest thou where in thy bloody sheet? Oh, what more favour can I do to thee than with that hand that cut thy youth in twain to sunder his that was thine enemy? Forgive me, cousin. Ah, dear Juliet, why art thou yet so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous and that the lean abhorred monster keeps thee here in his dark to be his paramour? For fear of that, I will stay with thee and never from this palace of dim night depart again. Here, here will I remain, with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest, and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. Eyes, look your last, arms, take your last embrace, and lips, O oh, you the doors of breath, seal with a righteous kiss. So, here he's talking, he starts talking here about seeing Tybalt's body and being kind of racked with guilt. He says, forgive me, cousin, when he sees Tybalt's body, because he views him as, as a cousin, almost as a family member now, due to his union with Juliet. He then calls out to Juliet, oh dear Juliet, are you so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous? This idea that death is amorous, the idea that death is kind of lustful, um, and filled with desire for, for, for bodies, for, for, young, for young lovers like themselves. Again, reinforces that idea of love being corrupting, love being parasitic. But even at this point where Romeo is about to kill himself, there's this idea about the inauspicious stars. 
This is the idea of kind of unfavourable fortune. Remember, celestial imagery, stars, is to do with fate. So he's going to shake the stars of his own fate. That links to the idea of I defy you stars. Once again, he wants to resist his fate. He wants to resist what the stars have in store for him. And he takes control of his own fate by taking his life instead of living miserably. And these are his final words before he kills himself. A dateless bargain to engrossing death. So he's making a contract with death. Come, bitter conduct, come, unsavoury guide. Thou desperate pilot, now at once run on. The dashing rocks thy seasick weary bark. Here's to my love. And he drinks, he raises the poison, almost like a toast to Juliet. Here's to my love. O oh, true apothecary, thy drugs are quick. And thus, with a kiss, I die. And those are his final words. So we have that idea once again. With a kiss, I die. Love being aligned with death for the two lovers. Now remember at this point, the friar um, has been alerted to the fact that Romeo hasn't received the message about Juliet not being dead. And Balthazar has also been watching what's been taking place in the tomb. So he runs to go and alert the friar and the friar then runs um, to the tomb. We're just going to skip on to page 115. So Balthazar and the friar have arrived. The friar, Balthazar is explaining to the friar what he's seen and he and the friar enter the tomb. So we're at this point here. Can you see line 140 is there and this is the point where they both enter the tomb. Romeo, oh pale, what? Who else? What? Paris too and steeped in blood? Oh, what an unkind hour is guilty of this lamentable chance. And this is where Juliet rises. Unfortunately, Romeo is already dead. The lady stirs. Oh, comfortable friar, where is my lord? I do remember well where I should be. And there I am. Where is my Romeo? And there is a noise within. I hear some noise, lady, come from that nest of death, contagion and unnatural sleep. A greater power than we can contradict hath thwarted our intents. Come, come away, thy husband is in thy bosom. There, thy, thy husband in thy bosom, there lies dead. So your husband is there lying in your lap and he is dead. And Paris too, come, I'll dispose of thee. Among a sisterhood of holy nuns, stay not to question, for the watch is coming. Come, go, good Juliet, I dare no longer stay. And he exits. This is the moment, of course, when Juliet is about to take her own life. Go, get thee hence, for I will not away. So she refuses to leave. What's here, a cup closed in my true love's hand? Poison, I see, hath been his timeless end. O oh, churl, drunk all, and left no friendly drop to help me after. I will kiss thy lips. Happily some poison yet doth hang on them to make me die with a restorative. Thy lips are warm. So she sees that Romeo has died of poison and hopes that there is some left on his lips. She uses the word restorative, like the idea of the kiss of life, but instead she subverts it. She wants the kiss from Romeo to be the kiss that will seal her death. Thy lips are warm. The captain of the watch has arrived now. Lead boy, which way? And we hear him from behind arriving. As they arrive to prevent what's about to occur in the tomb, that's where Juliet decides to take her life and she takes the dagger. Yea, noise, then I'll be brief. Oh, happy dagger, the oxymoron, the idea that she's embracing death. A dagger is normally something dangerous, violent, unpleasant, but she calls it a happy dagger. It's the thing that's going to help her embrace death and end her suffering. And she takes Romeo's dagger. This is thy sheath. And she stabs herself. There rust and let me die. And the language there, rust and let me die. Rusting is what happens when something is old, when it's kind of well used, when it's worn. She wants this dagger to remain there in her body and to end her life. But it contrasts with the idea of her youth. And it reminds us of her untimely death, that Juliet is not supposed to die at this moment. And she falls on Romeo's body and dies. So at this stage, both of the lovers have now lost their lives. And we're now about to see that aftermath. Both of them have chosen to end their lives rather than to live without the other. And so this emphasises that idea of fate. Remember the star-crossed lovers and their death-marked love. And it brings that element of the story to its conclusion. 
Okay, we'll continue with this scene in the, in the next and very final video. We're very nearly there now for part two to see the aftermath of the lover's death. Well done.